Okay, I was going to do a vid on the evolution of Christianity, how it's changed over the 2,000 years. While doing so, I was researching and I came across a wonderful book by Hypatia, or Hypatia, or perhaps even Hypatia, Bradler Bonner. If you've not heard of her, her father was Charles Bradler. If you've not heard of him, look him up. I'll put a wiki link in there. He was the most famous English atheist of the um, last century, sorry, the century before. He founded the National Secular Society. He was elected to Parliament, and uh, this resulted in eventually in him being imprisoned in uh, the St. Stephen's Tower, Big Ben, um, because he refused to take his oath on the Bible. And uh, after his death, you know, the good, honest Christians started lying and spreading uh, rumours that he'd converted to Christianity or whatever on his deathbed, which uh, his daughter actually, I believe, successfully sued someone, but she spent some time fighting that. How far we've come in a hundred years, you know, fighting lying Christians. The book is very apposite, um, uh, because it's all about hell. And it's funnily, it was actually written or released in 1913. So 100 years ago today. So I thought it would be interesting. I mean, well, it is interesting. I've read it, but it's interesting to, to look at how she was viewing the past compared to the present in 1913 from our vantage point of having a hundred years progress on top of that so i'm going to read the preface and introduction to you and i want you to tell me what you think if you like hearing me read the book then give me a thumb up if you don't like me reading the book thumb me down and that will give me a good idea of whether i should do this again and uh, without any further ado here's the preface and introduction preface what old woman is so stupid now as to tremble at those tales of hell which were once so firmly believed in, asked Cicero nearly two thousand years ago. This belief in an afterworld of pain so scornfully rejected by the pagan philosophers was made the cornerstone of the new Christian religion, and from the first century of the Christian era to the twentieth it has done more to poison the wells of human happiness than any other evil, real or imaginary, known to mankind. Many books have been written upon the eschatology of the Christian religion, but the earlier ones were avowedly for the purpose of maintaining the reality of the last judgment and enlarging upon the awful fate which awaited the sinner in hell, while the object of most of the more recent is to deny that reality and to explain away the terrors. The books which have dealt with this subject from a really critical and historical point of view are few and far between and have the disadvantage that they are written from the theistic standpoint. In any case, they are bulky volumes, more suited to the theological student or the man of leisure than for the information of the general public. Within the narrow limits of the following pages, I have endeavoured briefly to set forth the nature of the teaching of the Christian churches in English-speaking countries, and, even at the risk of becoming wearisome, I have so far as possible given either the actual words or a brief resume of the words of those whose authority has been accepted or whose influence has been of weight in some or other of the various sects which are sheltered under the name of Christianity. The subject is one which urgently calls for free and open discussion upon serious lines and should no longer be confined to the jester or to the timid utterances of clerics, who are necessarily hampered by the consciousness that any but the most superficial criticism is bound to undermine the creed which they have made it the business of their lives to disseminate and uphold. A sane and sound morality has everything to gain from the letting in of a little light upon a doctrine which is even at this day cankering the lives of hundreds of thousands of our fellows, men, women and children especially the children, in different parts of the world. Where this terrible dogma does not embitter happiness, it corrupts character. Where people believe with a realized belief, their whole lives must be overshadowed with its stupendous horror. Where they only pretend to believe, the extent of their hypocrisy can be measured only by their pretense. The task of preparing this little book has not been a pleasant one, and as it proceeded there have been moments when I have been compelled to lay aside my work. 
I have felt absolutely overwhelmed and sickened by the interminable repetition of ferocious exultations at the pain and sorrow supposed to await the majority of the human race, the nauseous imaginings, the inhumanity of man to man. I have, however, been encouraged to persevere in my task by the hope that these pages may help some here and there to realize the full and dreadful significance of the Christian hell, and realizing it, to reject it as a debasing and humiliating survival of an ignorant and superstitious past. HBB, October 1st, 1913. Chapter 1. Introduction. Among scholars and advanced thinkers, there exists a comfortable assumption that the idea of the devil and hell has become a negligible quantity that it is not worth bothering about, except as a matter of antiquarian research. It is a subject rarely discussed, seldom even named, in polite society, and is considered rather an unseemly topic for the platform or for general conversation. Contrasted with the widespread terrorism of the past, this attitude is indeed sufficiently remarkable, and if we looked no further, we might be led to believe that the days of hell as a priestly incentive to morality have passed away. Unfortunately for morality, this sanguine view is very far from representing the real state of affairs. It is true that during the last half century, among certain classes of the community in England and other progressive countries, there has been a notable decline in the belief in hell as a place of punishment for evildoers. Up to fifty years ago, the Bible was regularly read in nearly all middle-class families in England and Scotland. It was read day by day, chapter by chapter, from Genesis to Revelation. And when the last chapter of Revelation was finished, the reader turned back and began at the first in Genesis once more. This practice, once universal, has now almost disappeared in large centres, but is still to be found among dwellers in small country towns and rural villages. Fifty years ago the Bible was looked upon as all-important for the instruction of the young in the schools, and in season and out of season it was hammered into the minds of the working classes. Religion, with its hopes and fears of rewards and punishments, was held necessary for women, children, and the common people. Dr. Thomas Burnett, 1635-1715, who opposed the doctrine of eternity of punishment in his Latin treatise De Statu Mortuorum, nevertheless enjoined, Whatsoever you determine within yourself and in your own breast concerning these punishments, whether they are eternal or not, yet you ought to use the common doctrine and the common language when you preach or speak to the people, especially those of the lower rank, who are ready to run headlong into vice and are to be restrained from evil by the fear of punishment. To this advice he puts a marginal note. Whoever shall translate these sentiments, from the Latin which, in which he wrote, into our mother tongue, I shall think it was done with evil design and to bad purpose. Dr. Watts recklessly disregarded this injunction and appended a translation as a note to Discourse 13 in his World to Come. The Rev. J. Francis, preaching against Chartism in 1839, expressed the opinion that a firm belief in a hell where the wicked shall be eternally tormented was a certain safeguard against political agitation. Fifty years ago, Herbert Spencer could write, Even now, for the great mass of men, unable through lack of culture to trace out with due clearness those good and bad consequences which conduct brings round through the established order of the unknowable it is needful that there should be vividly depicted future torments and future joys pains and pleasures of a definite kind produced in a manner direct and simple enough to be clearly imagined nay still more must be conceded few if any are as yet fitted wholly to dispense with such conceptions as are current. Theology, says Professor Berry, has been regarded as a good instrument for keeping the poor in order and unbelief as a cause or accompaniment of dangerous political opinions. The idea has not altogether disappeared that free thought is peculiarly indecent in the poor, that it is highly desired to keep them superstitious in order to keep them contented that they should be duly thankful for all the theological as well as social arrangements which have been made for them by their betters. 
I may quote from an essay of Mr. Frederick Harrison, an anecdote which admirably expresses the becoming attitude of the poor towards ecclesiastical institutions. The master of a workhouse in Essex was once called in to act as a chaplain to a dying pauper. The poor soul faintly murmured some hopes of heaven, but this the master abruptly cut short, and warned him to turn his last thoughts towards hell. And thankful you ought to be, said he, that you have a hell to go to. Before the disintegrating force of the higher criticism made itself felt, the authorised English version of the Bible was accepted by English-speaking people as true in its entirety. Every word of it was taken in its exact and literal meaning. There was no selection of texts, no accepting of some and rejecting of others. All were divinely inspired. All were the direct utterance of an almighty God. When therefore people read, in Matthew 25.41, that the Lord said, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. They believed the fire was a real fire, as real as, and far more powerful than that at which they warmed themselves and cooked their food. They believed that the devils were evil-smelling monsters with hoof, horns, and tail, restless and unappeasably malign. The impression they received from the Bible was strengthened and enlarged by the teachings of the early Christian fathers and of noted contemporary divines, and even more, perhaps, by the vivid descriptions drawn by popular writers like Bunyan, whose Sighs from Hell, or The Groans of a Damned Soul, has gone through many editions. The poets also have had their full share in making hell real to the believing Christian. From Cadman to Milton, the gloomy horrors of hell have been an unfailing source of inspiration. Indeed, Dante and Milton, between them, are said to have done more to make hell real to people than any other writers, lay or clerical, but that is an aspersion. Many who reject the gross barbarism and brutality of the Old Testament accept the new with unction. Nevertheless, the appalling doctrine of eternal punishment, which is the keystone to the New Testament, was unknown to the earlier Hebrews. The New Testament teaches everlasting punishment as a fate, which can be avoided neither by the unbeliever nor the rich man, whatever chances of salvation may be open to the rest. Mark 16.16 16, He that believeth not shall be damned. 2 Thessalonians 2.11-12 2, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. The doctrine of exclusive salvation has been held from the earliest ages by every Christian church. St. Ignatius, 1st and 2nd centuries, in writings to the church of Ephesus says, Do not err, my brethren, if any should corrupt the faith of God by evil doctrine, such a one, being defiled, shall depart into fire unquenchable, likewise he who heareth him. Without the church no one is saved, said Origen. No one cometh to salvation and eternal life, except he who hath Christ for his head. But no one can have Christ for his head, except he that is in his body, the church, was the verdict of St. Augustine. St. Fulgentius was, if possible, still more explicit. Hold most firmly, and doubt not that not only all pagans, but also all Jews, heretics, and schismatics who depart from this present life outside the Catholic Church are about to go into eternal fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. This was the view taken by most of the fathers. At the Reformation all parties accepted the definition of faith called the Athanasian Creed, and acted upon it. Luther taught that remission of sins and sanctification are obtained only within the church. Calvin said, beyond the bosom of the church, no remission of sins is to be hoped for, nor any salvation. Luther and his adherents refused to hold communion with Zwingli and Acalampadius, and both denounced the Socinians and Anabaptists. Calvin burned Servetus, and the reformers of Holland expelled the Arminians, not only from the communion, but from their country. The British churches have also insisted upon an exclusive salvation. The contrary doctrine, that every man shall be saved by the law or sect which he professeth, was declared anathema by the Synod of London in 1562, and the Catechism of Dean Nowell, approved by various ecclesiastics in the time of Elizabeth I, gives question and answer thus. 
Is there hope of salvation outside the church? Without it there is nothing but damnation, destruction and perdition. The Saxon Confession, presented to the Synod of Trent in 1551, the Helvetic Confession, the Belgic, the Scottish, all agree in consigning the unbeliever to hell. The Westminster Confession of the Presbyterian Divines in 1647 declares that outside the true religion there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. The Independents, and even the Quakers, avowed the same doctrine. The case of the rich man is very little better than that of the heretic. Mark 19.24, Mark 20.25, Luke 18.25 It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Luke 16.22 The beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivedest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. According to these verses, the only vice of the rich man is his wealth. The only virtue of the poor man is poverty. The New Testament leaves no room for uncertainty as to the nature of the punishment which awaits the damned. Hell is described in Matthew 5:22 and 18:8 and 9 as a region of fire, in Mark 9:43-48 as a fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, in Mark 9:49 as a place where every one shall be salted with fire, in Matthew 13:42 and 50 as a furnace of fire where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In Revelation 14.10, as a region of fire and brimstone. In Revelation 19.20, as a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation 20.10-15, as the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The Church of England is further committed to the doctrine of eternal torment through the Book of Common Prayer. The Athanasian Creed begins and ends with the threat that those who do not keep their faith whole and undefiled shall perish everlastingly. The more enlightened among the clergy and the laity desire to get rid of or modify the Athanasian Creed, but there is a body of opinion powerfully represented in the English Church Union which declares that the Creed is true and must be defended to the death. In the litany appeals are addressed to the good Lord to preserve miserable sinners from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from thy wrath and from everlasting damnation. The ferocious commination service dwells upon the most just judgment pronounced by God when he consigns sinners into the fire everlasting. The sick are not spared, for in the order for the visitation of the sick, the minister is instructed to terrify the possibly dying person with talk about the accusing and condemning and the fearful judgment. Even in the form of solemnization of matrimony, the dreadful day of judgment is not overlooked. The 39 articles, which it is commanded that no man may draw aside in any way, or take in any but the literal and grammatical sense, accept the Athanasian Creed as proven by Holy Scripture, and assert the descent of Christ into hell, and the unspeakable comfort to godly persons of predestination and election. Officially, therefore, the Church of England expressly and repeatedly accepts the doctrine of everlasting punishment. But since the day when Archdeacon Farrar repudiated with all his force a doctrine so cruel and so horrible, Church of England Protestants have been gradually giving up a belief in a hell as a place of physical torment, although they retain the formulas in their religious books and continue to recite them in their churches and to teach the doctrine to children and primitive peoples. Farrar's repudiation was no sudden or isolated abandonment. He merely gave deliberate and emphatic utterance to the long smouldering revolt of enlightened humanity against the inhumanity of religious barbarism. In spite of their oaths and in spite of ancient prohibitions, more and more are the divines of the church becoming eager to draw the articles aside and put their own interpretation and comment upon that which their common sense rejects. Archdeacons Farrar's 
declaration against eternal torment went by no means unchallenged. Dr. E. B. Pusey wrote a book of two or three hundred pages in which he exhaustively and conclusively proved that from the first century onwards everlasting punishment had been a part of Christian belief and teaching. Nonconformists have followed, with more or less hesitation, the example set them by churchmen. Generally speaking, they take a narrower view of their creed and attach greater value to the literal meanings of the words of the New Testament and to the teachings of their predecessors than their Anglican co-religionists. There are some, nay many, who altogether reject the doctrine of eternal torment, but there are also very many who continue to lay stress upon the horrors of hell. Nor can they do otherwise so long as they abide by the Westminster Confession, which allows no room for doubt. It distinctly says that the wicked who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast into eternal torments and be punished with everlasting destruction. To assert and maintain the contrary is denounced as very pernicious and to be detested. In the larger catechism, in answer to question 60, it is affirmed, They who, never having heard the gospel, know not Jesus Christ, and believe not in time, cannot be saved, be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature or the law of that religion which they profess. The shorter catechism, also agreed upon by the Westminster Assembly of 1647 and used in the schools of Scotland today, teaches that through the guilt of Adam's first sin all mankind fell under the wrath and curse of God and became liable to the pains of hell for ever, that no mere man can keep free from sin and every sin deserves God's wrath and curse both in this life and the life to come. Wholehearted followers of Calvin naturally preach his doctrines of predestination and eternal punishment. Even those who profess more liberal ideas cannot altogether rid themselves of hell and the devil. Take, for example, Pastor Thomas of Geneva, who has a considerable reputation outside his own canton, and a fairly numerous following at home and abroad, especially in Holland, where the Queen Wilhelmina is his fervent protector and admirer. Pastor Thomas has no doubt about the existence of the devil. In a work entitled Fiction au Réalité, published in 1903, he speaks of the power of Satan, saying that it is great but not infinite, and the day on which God wishes to destroy him, he will do so at once. To represent the devil as a mere tool, dependent on God's will and pleasure, is apparently the best a 20th century professedly liberal Calvinist Protestant can do for humanity. The Lutherans are in no better case. In February 1909, eight of the Lutheran clergy of Sweden, including Bishop Lonegren, attended a meeting organized by the Stockholm Free Thought Society for the purpose of advocating measures to enable the clergy to deny the existence of the devil, hell, and eternal damnation without being penalized. Seven out of the eight voted for retaining hell and the devil. The eighth, Pastor Niels Hannes, openly stated that among his religious conceptions there was no place for the devil, and later he wrote in an open letter, I deny all belief in a devil. This outspoken declaration on the part of Pastor Hannes was gravely considered at the Stockholm Consistorium. During the discussion, the chairman, Pastor Primarius Hall, said, We must stand by the Augsburg Confession, and we cannot deny Jesus' own word, for it is not in a few places, and to a small extent only, that he talks of the devil. His colleagues, for the most part, seem to agree with him, although after several meetings and prolonged discussions, they ended in acquitting Pastor Hannes of unorthodoxy. The Salvation Army, a body constantly and successfully appealing to the public for funds, owes its very existence to the doctrine of hell. It was born of eternal damnation. It lives on blood and fire. Without hell, there would be no salvation. The orders and regulations direct that persons who doubt the existence of a real devil, a real hell, must not be recommended as candidates for officership. The officer has to see that his soldiers are supplied with facts about heaven and hell, and must constantly seek to startle people with talk about death, the judgment day, and hell, with its reproaches, upbraidings, and companionships. 
its memories, its despair, and its duration. He is instructed that the terrors of the law, that is, such subjects as sin, death, judgment, hell, and the like, will be found most useful to awaken sinners and bring them to repentance. These topics alarm and make men think and feel and seek mercy. The FO must not take any notice of the objections of ignorant people about working on the feelings of sinners by trying to arouse their fears. In the Religious Trust Deed of the Army, 1868, in which William Booth declared that the religious doctrines professed, believed and taught are and shall ever be, as therein laid down, the eleventh and last article runs, We believe in the immortality of the soul, in the resurrection of the body, in the general judgment at the end of the world, in the endless punishment of the wicked. This is repeated in the Articles of War as the eighth clause, and is the eleventh article of the doctrine of the Salvation Army, appended to the candidate's form of application for appointment as officer. The Salvation Army not only makes the endless punishment of the wicked an article of belief to be held for ever, but insists upon its officers continually dinning its despair and its duration into people's ears. The great day of judgment, sin and hell, are the inspiration of every great revival movement. They are also the master cards replied upon by the missionary in his none too successful gamble for the souls of enlightened Chinese and of ignorant and superstitious savages. Missionaries, however, overrate the value of the fear of hell as a means of conversion. It may win over the timid and cowardly, but it repels the brave and loyal. It is told of Radbod, an old Scandinavian king, that after long resistance he finally consented to be baptized. He had put one foot in the water when he bethought himself to ask the priests if he should meet his forefathers in heaven. He was told no, that they, being unbaptized heathens, were eternally damned in hell. He therefore drew back his foot, saying that he preferred to be in hell with his brave ancestors than in heaven with the Christian priests. There are radbods to be met with everywhere, wherever there are brave and loyal men. Revivals are encouraged by wealthy Christians, and millions of pounds are subscribed every year by Christians of every denomination to support foreign missions. The subscribers may or may not believe in hell for themselves, but they cheerfully pay for this horrible doctrine to be taught to others. The subscribers should be under no illusion as to the use that is made of their money, in this respect at least, for the appeal is made to them expressly to save the soul of the heathen. An American missionary in a public address on his return from China said, 50,000 a day go down to the fire that is not quenched. 600 millions more are going the same road. Should you not think at least once a day of the 50,000 who that day sink to the doom of the lost? The American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions declared that to send the gospel to the heathen is a work of great exigency. Within the last 30 years, a whole generation of 500 millions have gone down to eternal death. In a tract issued by the board, we find the heathen are involved in the ruin of the apostasy and are expressly doomed to perdition. Six hundred millions of deathless souls on the brink of hell. What a spectacle! The Reverend Sir G. W. Cox, in his Life of Bishop Colenso, records the solemn protest made by Colenso against the prayer printed for the use of a missionary institution of the Church of England, which begins, O eternal God, creator of all things, mercifully remember that the souls of unbelievers are the works of thy hands, and that they are created in thy resemblance. Behold, O Lord, how hell is filled with them to the dishonour of thy holy name. Whatever waverings may be found in the real or nominal beliefs of non-Catholic Christians, there is no ambiguity whatever, and there never has been any ambiguity in the teachings of the Church of Rome, by far the most numerous of all Christian bodies. Catholic authorities have differed as to whether the judgment of the dead takes place immediately after death, or at some later period. Origen even ventured to suggest that after a period of suffering, there would be an end to hell's torments, but he was denounced for his heresy and the Catholic Church has always made a hell of punishment for sinners an article of faith and a source of income. In this 13th year of the 20th century, we actually have a learned professor of theology, Herr Joseph Bautz, at the University of Munster, publishing a book upon hell in which he explains that at the present time hell and its fires are not necessarily very extensive since they are inhabited solely by spirits. 
If after the resurrection of the body these dimensions are insufficient, the creator of the new abode will provide accordingly. And this is up-to-date teaching in enlightened and scientific Germany. Since Protestantism happens to preponderate so overwhelmingly in Great Britain, Catholicism is comparatively quiet and unobtrusive, and consequently rationalists are rather apt to ignore it. This is not altogether wise, for although the Church of Rome may be quiet, it is not idle. Its active and persistent opposition to secular education met with some measure of success at the Trade Union Congress of 1912, and it avowedly seeks to gain an influence in the labour movement. In Australasia and in Canada, where Catholicism is much stronger than in England, its influence is proportionately greater and is used more openly and directly. The threat of withholding absolution for sin is a formidable lever when applied to a credulous people who believe that those who die in a state of mortal sin are doomed to the everlasting tortures of hell. Protestant Christianity is today in the melting pot. The Protestantism of 60 or 70 years ago is rapidly disappearing from the towns, if more slowly, from the rural district. That that church has already gained sufficient power to turn the scale against rationalism on the question of secular education in a congress of labour men and women is sufficiently serious and ought to be regarded as a warning. Education in the church schools under Protestantism has been irrational enough, as we know to our cost. Among the first lessons in reading and spelling, contained in a little book entitled Little Albert's Primer, and lately in use in the village schools of the south of England, we find such passages as, As for such as love not the way of the Lord, he will hide his face from them and will not save them, but they shall go down to the pit. As for the boy who is naughty and takes God's name in vain, he will come to an ill end, and he be not well whipped at school and at home day and night. On the cover of the back is a child's evening hymn, of which the second verse begins thus. But how my childhood runs to waste, my sins, how great their sum. Bad as this is, it is enlightened compared with the education which has existed in such Catholic countries as Spain and Portugal. Rationalists are striving to win definite moral instructions for the children in the schools. But so long as the doctrine of the pit, the ill end, the wrath to come, and sin is taught, there can be no true moral training. Fear is the foundation upon which the priest insists that character must be built up, and never yet has a true and stable morality been built upon the quicksands of fear. That's the end of the introduction. Thumb up if you want to hear more. Thumb down if you don't. And thanks for listening.